Lieutenant Jordy LaForge gets into a fight with a turbo lift. Dr. Pulaski is sending medical teams through the access tunnels. And an Enterprise nurse doesn't know what a splint is. Hello, everybody, and welcome to <laughs> The Seventh Rule with Sorok Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2, Episode 11, entitled Contagion, written by Steve Gerber and Beth Woods, directed by Joseph L. Scanlon. This was March 18th, 1989, four weeks after the previous episode. Nice hiatus there. Uh, and we have a very special guest today. What luck. We actually found a real-life Iconian. Thank goodness. It's Dr. <laughs> Trek, Larry Nemechek. What's up, Larry? Hey, hey don't saddle me with that Iconian stuff. The <laughs> jury's still out on those guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, we Thanks are for, uh, extremely thankful up? to have you on the show because uh, oh, yeah. you are one of the uh, the champions of Star Trek knowledge. And I think that it will come in very handy for this episode and the fans are going to love it. Also, a very special thanks very quickly, everybody, to our good friend, Carl Frederickson, for uh, sponsoring this entire episode today. Thank you so much, Woo! Carl Frederickson, yeah. our good buddy that we see at STLV and in the live chat. Anyway, how are you guys doing? Great. Uh I'm uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. This was uh <laughs> have you have you have you announced the episode? Yeah, it's contagion, right? Right. Yeah. I'm on the right page. Okay. No. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yes, no, it is contagion. This, yeah, this whole thing, because you think contagion and you think, oh, it's a it's a it's a medical show. It's a medical emergency show and you know, viral play. That's what something. I thought. That's what I thought. Yeah. I'm and going it's into viral, it. but it's you know, but not the way you think. But I, like a I computer, it's a computer it. virus, is what yeah. it really is. Yeah. Mm. And here's the thing: this, this, this is one of those shows that, in the blur of all the episodes, you go, you don't think about it as a, you know, a big show or a landmark show or episode, and then you get into it. I mean, like I, I, I can remember Contagion. Okay, if I'm thinking the right show. Oh, that one. It's the Iconian show. Mm -hmm. And you go, okay, right. and you move on. And then DS9, you know, went back to the Iconians and. And they've even been, you know, mentioned a couple other times. But uh, on the can on the you remind stuff. us uh, when and where on Deep Space Nine the Iconians yeah. were mentioned for there, for Carl there, Fredrickson? Uh, I I yeah. know, but there's a there was an episode uh, called "To the Death," and okay. they actually stumble across uh, an icon. Cisco and his team uh, stumble across a, a Iconian gate, one of these gateways that we see in this episode. And they're worried about uh, the Dominion getting a hold of the technology mm -hmm. or, or others, and they actually use it to get there. And it's a it's all, it's it's also a, a battle with Jem Hadar. That's I think it's the oh I'm doing this off the top of my head. Isn't that the one oh, with, yeah, the, yeah. with the uh, rebel Jem the rogue Jem Hadar and the good Jem Hadar? Right. Are going well, check this out. Uh, I'm just pulling up a cheat sheet here because it's very important. <laughs> this was this episode was a uh, season four episode twenty three written by. Ira Stephen Bear and Robert Hewitt Wolf, the gold standard, and directed by also the gold standard, LeVar Burton. So this was a really big episode that uh, they were mentioning. Really cool. And so obviously LeVar bought his firsthand knowledge of, <laughs> <laughs> right. of Iconians. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow. It's, but I think that since they were like ancients and long dead and their technology hung around, and like makeup didn't have to spend budget to imagine what they look like or didn't look like, you know. So it's people have had a lot of fun with them. I think the novel writers, uh, I think people will refer. There's there was a uh, Tom Paris referred to the Mount of Voyager episode one time mm -hmm. uh, as a joke. But um, it's like it's this enigma. So everybody can have fun with it and it can be danger. Or it could be, you know, you can stumble across some ancient Iconian technology for a, for a plot. So it, they're handy. Um, Old dead aliens Larry are handy that way. It is. And it actually, when I was hearing about them, I was thinking of like Atlantis and the story yes. of Atlantis. I was thinking of also like the ancient Egyptians and their civilization. Um, but really of, of Atlantis, because it's more of a fairy tale, more of something unseen yeah. where there's really no evidence of it except for writings here and there. Um, but the technology, uh, it's supposedly so advanced that if it you know falls into the wrong people's hands, in this case the Romulans, um, 
they, they have the ability to strike anywhere essentially right. is that what it right. is that what it is yeah well you know the old the 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 knock against one of the the bits from the Kelvin movies was that long range transporter and part of the original writing once, you know, they, they invented the gene invented the transporter to avoid landing a ship and visual effects. And that cost her every week in, in a 1966 way of looking at things. And then the transporter though, quickly obviously became, you know, the, the tool that failed and you launched into all kinds of drama, whether it was a cool thing like enemy within or, or, you know, just a cheat to get, to get somebody into danger or leave them stuck where they can't escape and all that. And, but the, the basic thing they had to kind of limit to not let the writers go wild was, you know, you had to put a limit on the transporter. Otherwise, if you had like long distance beaming, why would you need ships? You know, like, but so the Iconians basically are like, haha, we didn't need ships. We actually could <laughs> like go halfway across the galaxy or whatever. And that's what made them. So, so the line I always remember from this is, um, is Picard saying something about you know demons of air and uh, air and space? Or, yeah, demons of of air and space, space. and darkness. Something space like that. Space and darkness. Yeah, I always remember yeah. that line. But I mean, that basically sums it up. If you can like just kind of come in and kamikaze in out of with no warning at anybody, no wonder they were you know. And then for everybody to gang up on them and finally put them down. Uh, right. Quickly, you, just you, to correct myself, it's uh, demons of air and darkness. Just looked it up. Okay. Demons of air and darkness. We were mm -hmm. farther ahead than I am, but um, but it is. It's that. That's the line that kind of sums up the whole Iconian thing. So if the people they were, you know, terrorizing, it was like you know, it was like a futuristic blitzkrieg or something. If they would just yeah. pop him out of nowhere, yeah. it, it wasn't even shock and awe. It's just the fact that they could pop in anywhere, and you kind of got a little taste of that in Contagion. You know, um, is there a time limit? Is that is that porthole that gateway? Does that go into present day of anywhere you want oh, like a time oh right. i don't Whoa. think they ever they never brought time like a guardian of forever kind of a thing they never right. brought time into it it was always like at the moment so right. you could go right. a million places and i don't and they never got into like they never went into like the technology or or about controlling it like like picard and data are standing and war for standing there watching it just cycle through Mm -hmm. Just like Kirk and Spock did with the Guardian of Forever, except that was in time. It was all Earth, but it was in time. And this is just a case of, you know, like, and probably a lot of those scenes, they didn't even know where they were, but they recognized their ship and they recognized the Romulans, you know. You know, there was so something knows, about yeah, that. Like, there was something about that that didn't quite vibe with me, as the French say. And maybe I missed mm -hmm. something, which was. How did they know that walking through that gateway would actually put them there? How did they know it wasn't just like, you know, visual representation yeah. of it? And yeah. I, I assumed and I expected they would throw something across it first to test it out. Uh, if they threw like that tricorder, for example, they throw it across into the, the Enterprise Bridge and mm -hmm. then they see Riker on the other side picking it up and going, where did this come from? Then they'd say, OK, this is safe. But otherwise, they just walked in. Did I miss that, or did they just just skip that part completely? It's it's second season, Ryan. What can I say? It's... <laughs> well, what what's wrong with the second season? Well, they what did was that going on two, at that point? Well, they, they, they didn't did put Gilem, his hand didn't they in. They do that. They threw something yeah. through the doors and they picked it up on the other side. Remember Nagilam and the and the baffling. We're just going in circles in our own ship. Yep. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. No, they they did do it. And they just. You saw when Data put his hand inside of that. Yeah. Um, he, he actually reached in there and grabbed Worf's ass. They didn't show it from the other angle. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. That's how they knew it works. That was um, a deleted scene. Oh. It's a deleted scene from... Yeah. Let's get uh, that director's, director's cut. cut or I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I got to see this. <laughs> but no, I thought this episode was, was good um, because it had so like that kind of mythological aspect you know, behind it. Um, that was one of the things that was intriguing to me. And actually, they mentioned archaeology. So I, I, it almost felt like Indiana Jones-ish, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where the, you know, artifacts are involved, uh, archaeology. Um, They're trying to read and, the language. Right. Yeah. They're trying to read the language. They, they mentioned the Rosetta Stone, the, the galactic Rosetta Stone, and how this 
uh, artifact that was found by uh, Captain Barley, who I thought did a great job in this episode, too, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, for so his, for as little as he had, he did a lot with what he had to do. Yeah. He did a lot. I thought, and he played a captain uh, well to me. I thought he's, you know, he had that point of scene, you know, seniority, leadership, all of that stuff. Was Just to called. jump on that real quick, what makes his job extra tough is that not only that he comes in for a day of work, doesn't know the cast, doesn't know the crew, doesn't know whatever, most likely, um, but he's talking to a camera and there's an AD off, you know, off stage, just going, saying Picard's lines, very regular. And this guy yeah. has to show up at 5 a.m. on a Wednesday and talk to nothing and make it seem like he's having a full conversation. I watched Picard. Picard does it great, but he's had a year and a half to practice this. This poor dude has to come in and he did a great job of humanizing it, of adding his own little isms, of adding his own little hems and haws and thinking about it. Because sometimes we see these guest actors, they show up and they're just reading lines to a camera and you can tell. Mm -hmm. And he actually added a little bit more human aspect to it so shout out notice they did do a little bit they didn't it wasn't just totally a flat wall view screen character because on his it's a so a it's a sister ship so they get to do the old you know just redress it but they if you notice the tactical you know the horseshoe behind him the the pedestal in the middle they had the door open and they had the guts hanging out because supposedly they've all been racked by these you know malfunctions and they're like madly trying to trace stuff so and if if you it was cool because later on when they're in the Iconian portal and they're trying to jump back to uh, the Enterprise, the shot that you're seeing is I think it's Dexter Clay was the stand anyway. But he's sta- Worf's relief guy, his stand in and also the rhythm. Mm. He's standing there mm. and they've got the tactical horseshoe pedestal opened up, too. So I'm like, you know what? They shot him, his captain scenes there. And then they did these little bits to show through the portal at the same time because they had dressed up the, the pedestal. At the at the tactical station with like circuit board guts hanging out and everything. Yeah, here we go. But, but what my point quick. was that that mm-hmm. actor, the guest captain. Yeah. See. Yeah. That yeah, that he uh, he at least didn't have just a flat wall. He actually had a couple of extras behind him, and there was a little bit of life going on, and he didn't have to. He did a great mm-hmm. job, but at least he wasn't as stuck as some of those mm-hmm. guests who just do the view screen scenes. Right. No, I thought he did a great job. Um, I liked his um, his personal logs. They they felt oh, yeah, uh, that was the thing. They, yeah, that was a second gen- day of work on your own there when you're doing mm-hmm. a log. Yeah, I, I thought that was great. Um, and I also noticed Larry that this episode had a lot of sets, so they did have the they had the redress on the Enterprise, and then they had the Romulan uh, mm-hmm. bridge that they had to construct um i don't know if that was just sitting around already ready to go but they had to do that and then they had the iconian laboratory type room yeah. which i don't i don't know what that particular set was or how that was redressed from something else in the past but that had to be done as well so there I were a lot of was, uh, moments yeah. uh, where i felt like you know there's location wise they were filming a lot of the ship mm-hmm Well, this was, well, see, this is what I meant when I said there's, this is a misleading episode to go back and think about it in context, because I mean, for, for starters, well, here, here's the cool thing. We're in the strike time right now and people get their timeline mixed. Some people, you know, uh, Shades of Grey, right? The notorious clip show that I guess you you all haven't got to or. Stay tuned (laughs) for that, Ciroc. You are going (laughs) to love. Oh, wow. That is that is to well, I don't even want to give say anything, but just stay we'll tuned just for say, that. <laughs> but people must today people f- chalk that up to the strike. It was a, a cut short show, and it was it was totally over budget. The strike actually happened between one and two, not between mm-hmm. two and three. Okay. But the I was going back and getting refreshed on this, and one of the things it's like Michael Pillar comes in late in season three, and the whole reason that that opened the pitch process up to fans happened was because he was so behind and he wanted he knew there was a fandom and he wanted to open it up to that in a way that would make sense legally because there's all kinds of reasons why that had never been done before on any show and in this case maury hurley in season two was the showrunner and he was feeling that and they had already gone to the you know the old the scripts they'd done for phase two and that's where the child came from and he was behind Mm -hmm. the gun too 
um, they were coming out of the strike and he was behind and they were going there. So he's he had apparently wanted to open up the window for getting script ideas in also. But rather than going to fandom, he was just like he was just like looking everywhere. So apparently there's two writers on this, Beth Woods and uh, the Gerber. Steve Gerber. Steve Gerber. Yeah. So apparently Beth Woods, who I met later on, I didn't realize it. She was um, she was an employee for the computer company that serviced all the computers on the Paramount lot, not just the wow. Star Trek offices. And I had forgotten this Balboa computer. They were still had the contract when Lolita and Janet were working on Voyager. I mean, it was that long, mm -hmm. a long term thing. And she was, you know, they'd come by and check out their and it was night. Remember, it's 1987 and 88 and things are still, you know, new and woozy and early. And. And she's by the office a lot. And after a while, I'm sure somebody, maybe Maury Hurley, maybe one of the assistants said, oh, my God, we're scrambling around looking for, my God, if you had an idea, we'd even take it. And she's like, well, have you thought about a computer virus? Well, she basically pitched this idea, making her computer rounds. Mm -hmm. And then she was just, she didn't have any experience or representation. So she grabs um, this Gerber, yeah, who Steve it turns Gerber. out, Steve Gerber, I didn't mean to demean him there. He was the career he'd written for Marvel comics. And he's the one that created Howard the Duck. You know, it's really interesting oh. to add to that, that Beth Woods, I looked her up very quickly just now. She only has one other writing credit. So in mm -hmm. other words, she wasn't like a career writer. This was not what she did for a living. As you said, right. she worked at Paramount on the lot with the working on the computer or the, the computer company. Yet they didn't give her a just a story by credit which would be the norm they let her or advised her or asked her to partner up with steve gerber and actually write the full episode so she didn't just get a story by or idea by you know kind of credit she got the full written right. by steve gerber and beth woods which is really cool must have been so much fun for her and i think that's just great to give somebody that yeah. opportunity they must have really liked her well, it's on one hand, it's cool to hear a story like that, but those are the kind of stories that happen when things are kind of in chaos and there's not like a regular, <laughs> yeah. you know, machine going. But uh, but no, the other but the other thing is the idea itself is this is 88 and we were talking about, you know, we thought this was like a medical show or a pandemic, you know, disease plague show. People weren't up savvy yet with the idea of what a computer virus was. Like this is about the same, you know, I had just bought my Mac plus and I it was barely a thing that, oh, Macs don't get viruses like, you know, IBM's running Windows do or running DOS. And but just the world not being as computer literate and savvy and, you know, we, everybody's got a you can get viruses on your phone, and your pad, much less your desktop. So it was a, the whole idea of this not being a human virus or an organic virus, but a mechanical virus was like a new concept. So I'm sure when she mentioned this, everybody in the office went, ooh, that's cool. Now what? It could, you know, and then there's a whole conversation in the episode where they're talking about, you know, not a not a pandemic organic virus, but a, a computer virus. But they you notice when you're they're talking, they don't, you know, Jordy and and Data and Worf should have picked up on this right away, but they didn't. You know, later on, how many years is it till they're talking about doing a virus to infect the Borg, right? With you? Yeah. That's only like three years later. And within mm -hmm. three years, the world's turned around and everybody goes, oh, oh, a computer virus. Right. I get it by the early 90s. But at this point, it was still mm -hmm. a thing that was not only you had to explain it a little bit, but it was like, oh, that's a fresh idea. That's cool. So I, it's just this is a perfect like, you know, snapshot in time kind of. Yeah, story. Absolutely. And, and to jump on what Sirach was asking a little bit, I wanted to kind of ask a little bit more on that about the set. The Iconian set, because Sirach, when you asked that, it kind of made me think, it reminded me of the set they used when there was like those flashing lights. They were looking through like a big old microscope. Remember a few episodes ago at like flashing lights and they mm -hmm. said the flashing yeah. lights were an intelligent life. Um, I feel like it may have been repurposing that set. I don't remember exactly that episode, but. Uh, Larry, do you have the, any idea what if that was I, a set that they repurposed or if that you recognize it? Like, well, that was it was interesting because well, this is the season where they they uh, they overspent budgets. That's the reason why <laughs> Shades of Grey wound up at the end, and it's the season you're coming down the line for Q Who, and they were scrimping and scrimping to build a little bit of a Borg alcove for the Borg, you know, 
bit, but um, they were they had spent a lot of money on the uh, Sherlock Holmes show on Elementary Dear Data, and that was like a huge mm-hmm. thing, and they put it in for the Emmys and all that, but it was way expensive. So, but I think they were spending more on sets just thinking they had to. And I don't know, but because this, you, like you mentioned, this is had the uh, Romulan set and they built a little baby set the very first time they had Romulans at the end of season one with neutral zone. And that was just mainly a glorified flat wall with the two Romulans, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but this I is think like it was a home set soil. because people are doing blocking and running around and Picard beams in. It's not just her on her captain's chair in a wall. It's it's a 3D, at least two or three walls of a set. Because, you know, you see when Picard beams in or when he walks through under their bridge. I think the episode was called Home Soil, actually. Season one, episode 17, oh, Home yeah. Soil. Um, anyway, just a thought. Um, I have a few questions. Um, first of all, I wanted to kind of piggyback a little bit what you were talking about, Larry, when you were mentioning the computer virus stuff. Um, data solves this problem by essentially uh, rebooting, right? He shuts down and then turns back on again, yeah. which which is which is a common thing to do nowadays <laughs> when you have issues with your computer. Turn them on and off. Did you try unplugging them, plugging back? <laughs> yeah, it would have been great yeah, if when yeah. data woke up and made that Apple sound, <laughs> that boom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it's so funny because that is a common thing to do to resolve an issue that you have when your phone's freezing or the yeah. screen's stuck or something. So you, you know, you turn it on, turn it back off. And I, I thought, wow, um, that's something that uh, way ahead of its time, that's something that everybody knows now, but in the 89, nobody was thinking about those kinds of concepts and it certainly wasn't popular yeah. on like a mass scale. Right. Um, in 89, so was, they would have picked up data and yeah. blown on him like a Nintendo <laughs> cartridge. <laughs> see if this <laughs> yeah so, so so i thought that was just really it's clever and also yeah don't touch that one larry and um <laughs> I, I am not about either <laughs> and um but here's my questions for you um number one uh-oh uh how many people would have died on a galaxy class ship if it were to have exploded like that oh are right. we talking uh, in the hundreds because like around it, 1,100, a little between 1,000 and 1,100 people. Yeah, I kind of was waiting to hear that number. Like, yeah. we, you know, we, we just lost 1,000 people or something to that effect. But I, uh, it was left up kind of open in the air because we only got the 18 in the beginning when, you know, Captain uh, Barley talks about we lost 18 people. And then right in front of our face, we see 1,000 people. And right. I, I, it, you know, it just tells me the magnitude of what we just witnessed. That yeah. was one thing I wanted to know. And you kind of let, other, like, Will or Wesley gets to kind of feel that. Which is good. You know, that scene at the end, yeah. You guys just we do need your it. jobs and you move right along. And it's like, oh, no, we feel it, which was kind of a nice. Yeah, I, I, I'm i glad they used Wesley for that. Um, I thought they needed that moment because I felt like they had to rush over the tra- the tragedy of losing that many people it, it felt like a little bit rushed yeah um so i'm glad they kind of doubled back and hit that moment but the iconians any any um, backstory on why they use that name um is there any well not really aside from it's just cheesy like icon i did iconian. not even make that connection oh yeah i just thought it sounded like draconian okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, was like. I didn't know where it came from. So interesting. It's okay. just they, yeah, they just, yeah. I, I mean, I, if there was a maybe somebody's, you know, I have a great uncle icon, and I named it for him. I don't know, but you know, I, I like just it. went, oh, that was cheesy. That like seems uh, so very early. The producer year. Armis <laughs> that they obviously named that monster Armis after. Yeah, yeah, he was there a half half season, I guess. But then. And, um, Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say also, because I always think of our good friend, uh, Matt Boardman, when I watch the visual effects, that ship exploding, uh, that was remastered because it looked... Had to be. There's no way that was 1989. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? I was like, what is this? That was gorgeous. That was great. That yeah. was great. So, yeah. Shout well, they, out to they, the first time, there. it was like a cheesy thing where it was just like the ship and then it kind of was just enveloped by a white light. And then they okay. had like the saucer coming at you, and that was kind of cool because it was peeling back and yeah. 
So you okay, remember so what that, it looked that, like? Yeah, I, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to ask you. What the original look was, and so that was the original look. Okay. Hmm, oh, there I, you go. I was watching whatever was on Paramount Plus. I didn't get my my disc. Set. But what's oh. but now watching and you guys are watching in order. So yeah. But this was the first time this ship had gotten the Yamato had gotten mentioned a few episodes before. But mm -hmm. um, but this is the first time we actually saw yeah. a sister galaxy class ship. And you know, and it's yeah. they were very cagey in the beginning because it was a galaxy class so you assume there's a USS galaxy and not to go all you know tech head here but um they were really cagey in the beginning about how many other uh galaxy class ships there were cuz they didn't on one hand they didn't want to tie it down they didn't want to make the enterprise d not as special you know mm -hmm. so yeah. you know the famous memo that we all go back and now it's in the news again with with uh with all the ships on strange new worlds but the old memo where you know the original series they tried to tie down and say there's 14 ships, but Kirk says there's 12, and then the Defiant's not on that list, you know. But all that, so they oh, were. Oh, that they were old argument. Rock and I are always. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, yeah. Larry, we only have a cool. minute this left. This is the first time they went there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We only have a minute left. Uh, real quick, when you say <laughs> KG, though, uh, Sorok and I think Kevin Garnett, of course. So I kind of have to make sure we know what we're talking about there. But before <laughs> you go, Larry. Can you tell everybody uh, about your shows? Because you do a lot of cool shows oh. on your own channel. Well, yeah. on uh, uh, the Trek Files is over at Roddenberry, and I we echo that too. But that's our fifth. That's weekly. We just went on our did ten seasons, and we're on our hiatus right now. But uh, that's a little twenty minute bit every week where we dig into Dean's files, and I have a guest on from the industry or someone's family, and we talk about that, like we had Sirach just recently. Wonderful. Uh, we wound up the season. Yeah, the, we wound up the season with Aaron Walkie from Prodigy, looking at some old animation uh, work. Dorothy's uh, interview with Dorothy Fontana from 1973, and then we we were reflecting on what was the same and what was different, you know. Now, so it's never dusty history. But no, tr uh, Trekline Tuesdays Live is Tuesdays at one Pacific and four Eastern and nine o'clock UK time. My live show every week, and. Um, What's Second the YouTube opinion, channel? A new episode. They could just look huh? up Larry Nemechek. Oh, it's, yeah, it's just everything is on uh, LarryNemechek.com is the website. And my YouTube channel, please like and subscribe because I got in late, is just Larry's Trekland on YouTube. But Second Opinion, Cadet Alice and Dr. Trek look at Prodigy is a lot of fun with my granddaughter. So we're having mm -hmm. a lot of fun. And then there's Portal 47 for your real background hounds and um, Trekland Treks if you come to L.A. and want to tour location tours that you put together yourself with my help so much stuff wow yeah <laughs> this is why they call you dr trek well that and also because yeah. you know everything about star trek and have written actual books yeah. about it so that's probably also why there's that there's that <laughs> there's that too <laughs> anyway thank you uh, so much larry for uh giving us the background knowledge and uh enlightening us oh well my pleasure i mean it's it's the stuff out there but it was uh you know one last thing this is the first episode that picard says t earl gray hot I noticed that when we uh, spoke with uh, it. Melinda Snodgrass, uh, we noticed that she was the one that first gave us poker, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the them playing poker together and other things. And then this was the first episode where Picard asked for T. Earl Grey hot. But as you just mentioned, wow. he doesn't actually get it. He doesn't actually get <laughs> it. So, so, so we could credit that to uh, Steve Gerber and Beth Woods. Yeah. There you go. There All right. Is. Okay. Thanks so much, Larry. We really appreciate you. Thank uh, you, Larry. Everybody else, stick around. We will be right back with more coverage of this glorious episode on <laughs> The Seventh Rule. Trek well, guys. <laughs>